Come on up. Jacob Prash doesn't need any introduction. He's been here many times. But I do want to introduce his wife who is here for the first time. Where is Pavia? Pavia is right here. Welcome, Pavia. Pavia was born in Romania, raised in Israel, and that's where Jacob met her. She was seeking uh, God. She was on her own quest to discover who God was. And they were ministering to the same Muslim man who had gangrene in his legs. And uh, Jacob ends up leading Pavia to Jesus Christ. Her parents are Holocaust survivors, although the rest of their family didn't make it through the Holocaust, her parents did. And so uh, it is a pleasure to have you this morning, Pavia. <laughs> and listen, after last night having dinner with him, this lady is so on fire for the Lord. Now I know why Jacob behaves so well. I have a signal, now I got a signal. If you don't know me, you're not missing much. My name is Jacob, I've been here before. I'm a friend of your pastor, and it's a wonderful blessing to be with you here in El Centro. Our ministry is called Moriel. We do have a website, Moriel, M-O-R-I-E-L.org. Also, some of the finest propaganda this side of the Atlantic, although I live mainly in England. Um, we have a couple of book and tape tables outside, should you be so inclined to visit us, we'd love to uh, get to know you a bit personally. Uh, told uh, nosotros tenemos para translación uh, mexicanos en la otra sala. Yo soy Jacobo Presta, nuestro ministerio es Muriel Ministries. Uh, nosotros tenemos dos palabras hoy, pero una iglesia. Gringos no hay, <laughs> mexicanos no hay. <laughs> Cristianos, en Jesucristo solamente. Hey. Jacob, before I forget, I want to apologize to those on the ba balcony for the camera. We're having lighting issues today, so the picture may not uh, come in very clear on the live stream or that, but hopefully we'll have that fixed next week. And uh, we actually, you and I, Jacob, look better this morning. <laughs> well, as you can see, my pretty wife can still wear the same dress she got married in. I can't even fit through the door to the same church. Muchacho gordo. <laughs> this morning I'd like to speak to you about my least favorite subject in the world. There is nothing I dislike speaking about more than I dislike speaking about this subject. It's not easy. And it's something that potentially, in fact almost inevitably at some point, will affect every one of us. The most difficult thing you or I will ever face as Christians, as saved believers in Jesus, the most difficult challenge to our faith, the thing that will spiritually and emotionally cause us more grief, more challenge to our beliefs, more of a problem in coming to terms with than anything else that will ever happen. The biggest problem we will ever have is not personal disappointment in this temporal world. People can experience professional failure, academic failure, failed relationships, business failure, setbacks in finance, setbacks in health, all kinds of problems. But nothing, including our own biological death, which is merely temporary, is going to be as big a problem as the real problem. The ultimate thing for ourselves if we give up the ghost, to live as Christ, to die as gain. The Greek word is katorgeo. In his own death and resurrection, Jesus abolished death. It doesn't concern us. It's like putting an inflated ball under the water in a swimming pool. You can put it under, but you can't keep it under. It's going to pop out again. The grave could not contain Jesus, and because of Jesus, it can't contain those who are in him. 
Now, if you're not in Jesus, you're in big trouble. No, it's not anything like that. The most difficult challenge you or I or any believer will ever face is coming to terms with the death of an unsaved loved one. A parent, husband, wife, God forbid, a child, grandparent. The death of a sibling, a brother or a sister. There is nothing you or I will ever have to deal with in this world that will be more difficult, more problematic, more challenging than coming to terms with the loss of an unsaved loved one. I go to funerals, and you can always tell at a funeral of a Christian, there is grief, there is sadness. But never once, never once at the funeral, at the grave of a believer, have I ever seen despair. Never. Never. There's only one fitting epitaph for a true believer in Jesus. Here lies so-and-so. Temporarily closed for renovations, will reopen soon. <laughs> John 5, 24. Though a man believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You lose a Christian husband, Christian parent, Christian anything. I'm sorry for your loss. But make sure when you chisel in the epitaph at the cemetery, it says, temporarily closed for renovations, will reopen soon. Grief, yes. Mourning, yes. Sadness, yes. My condolences. But despair, never. Never. It's a temporary separation. Moreover, it is to their advantage. Now, the death of a loved one who's not saved, what can you say? What can you say to encourage the family? Nothing. Now, only God ultimately knows what may or may not transpire at the second, the instance between life and death. Only God knows that. Only God ultimately knows what happens to someone. But we can know this. In the entire New Testament, we, of course, we only have one deathbed conversion. Only one. And people who do get saved on their deathbed generally tend to be people who would have gotten saved sooner had they known the gospel. They may just be prompted into it by fear, and God will use that. If you have an unsaved loved one and you're praying for their salvation, God may bring adversity into their life. He may put them on their deathbed to scare them into repentance. Better that than the alternative. Better that than the alternative. If you're here today, there's people who love you who are here. We'd rather see anything other than you be eternally lost forever is a long time. No matter what people tell you, Jesus spoke of hell as a literal place. It was not made for people. Jesus said hell was made for Satan and his angels. Nobody should ever go there except for Satan and demons. Nobody should ever go there. It's such a terrible place and such a real place that God became a man and died in your place and in mine so we wouldn't go there. By all rights, I should go to hell. As a teenager, I was a Marxist. By the time I got to university, I was strung out on cocaine. I got through my exams in college by taking amphetamine. I was crazy. Then I became a drug dealer. I'm not proud of it, but that's what I was. That's what I did. And many of my friends are the same. I got friends who are dead. They're pushing up daisies. As far as I know, they're in hell. But I'm here today just because of what Jesus did for me. No reason he should have done it. No reason he should have done it. But I'm glad he did do it. And if he did it for me, he can do it for you. I got saved literally off the streets in New York. Before we turn to the Old Testament, turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 12.
Verse 46, while he was still speaking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside, seeking to speak to him. Notice Jesus had brothers. <laughs> now, I know that's a problem for certain people. No offense. <laughs> and someone said to him, behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. And it's speaking of siblings in a biological context. It's not talking about neighbors or something like that. Your mother and your brothers. And he answered, the one who was telling him and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, behold my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. Turn with me, if you will, please, to the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel chapter 18. A schism took place between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. It would be reunited under David's leadership, but again fragment because of the sin of Solomon. But it begins in verse 1, Then David numbered the people who were with him and set over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. And David sent the people out, one-third under the command of Joab, one-third under the command of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and one-third under the command of Etai, the Gittite. And the king said to the people, I myself will surely go with you also. David was hedging his bets. Scripturally and historically, judgments have always happened to the Jews in thirds. Always. Remember, Ezekiel was to cut off his hair. One third he was to burn, one third he was to chop up with a sword, and one third scattered to the breeze. And a few he was to put into the tassels of the hem of his garment. Jesus said, not a hair of your head will perish. With the Babylonian captivity, one third of the Jews were killed by the sword by the Babylonians. One third were asphyxiated when Nebuchadnezzar burned Jerusalem, and one third were scattered to the diaspora. A few Jews survived. There's 613 commandments of the Torah, and there's one tassel on the hem of a Jew's garment. Today it's called a talit for every commandment of the Torah, and he had to affix a few halves to those. In other words, the Jews who kept the word of God, the word of God kept them. The rest, judgments happened in thirds. In the book of Zechariah, two-thirds of the Jews in Jerusalem are going to be killed by the Antichrist and his onslaught. Two-thirds. In the Holocaust of the 1930s and 40s, one-third of global Jewry and two-thirds of European Jewry were wiped out. Judgments have always happened in thirds. And so we continue. He breaks his army into thirds. Verse 3, but the people said, you should not go out, for if we indeed flee, they will not care about us, even if half of us die. But they'll care about us, but you are worth 10,000 of us. Therefore, it's better that you be ready to help us from the city. Their love for King David is remarkable. King David is the Old Testament shadow of Christ as king and as shepherd. He's the Old Testament shadow of Jesus as king and as shepherd. Then the king said to them, whatever seems best to you, I will do. So the king stood next to the gate, and all the people went out by hundreds and by thousands. Now David showed wisdom. Whatever seems best to you, I will do. This rebellion was instigated by his unbelieving son, or his backslidden son. His own son engineered the rebellion. Whenever you're dealing with family, objectivity goes out the window. The first casualty of dealing with a crisis involving a loved one is objectivity. It's so hard. Very often, unless it's a child, it's so hard to witness, to share the gospel to an unsaved loved one who knew you before you were saved. <laughs> People who you never met, they're going to accept you for what you are. People who knew you before you were a Christian, they know what strings to pull, what buttons to push. 
and the devil will make good use of it. So often it's easier, much easier, unless it's a little kid, to get somebody else to witness to an unsaved loved one. In the legal profession, they tell you, don't represent a relative. In the medical profession, unless it's an emergency, don't treat a relative. Objectivity goes out the window. It becomes emotionally impossible and spiritually almost impossible to be objective when you're dealing with family. Whatever seems good to you, I will do. Find trusted brothers and sisters, trusted ones, who are discreet and who have wisdom. It's so difficult to be objective when you're dealing with family. The natural propensity we all have is to think with our emotions when we're dealing with relatives, particularly children, siblings, things like that, parents. When you're in a crisis involving a family, involving an unsaved loved one, remember, it's almost impossible for you to be objective. Whatever seems good to you, I will do. But the king, in verse 5, charged Joab and Abishai and Etai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king charged all the commanders concerning Absalom. I know he's backslidden. I know he's unbelieving. I know he's treacherous. I know he's doing things that are unspeakable. Against God? against his family, against his nation. It's unspeakable what he's doing. But he's still my son. We just dedicated little Lily. I don't care if Lily is 20. I don't care if little Lily is 40. Her parents are always going to remember that little baby they were holding on this platform today. I don't care how old she gets. That's just the way it is. By God's design. By God's design, blood is thicker than water. I know he's no good. I know he's this. I know he's that. I know what he's doing. But he's still my son. Please don't let him get hurt. I had to speak at a big conference here in California once. And I knew the place where my son was in Israel was getting shelled by Katushas, by the Muslims and from Lebanon. And uh, I couldn't get a phone call through, see how he was. It was terrible. When I finally got a phone call through, I heard sirens going off in the background. They didn't get in the shelters. It's very difficult, you know, when you know your son is in a place where he's strategically vulnerable. My son was in the Israeli army and things like that. Very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. Fortunately, the Jack Hibbs, you know Jack Hibbs, the Calvary pastor, he knew an Israeli general, and he got a phone call through to Israel. And he actually got a general in the midst of the war, and the general found out the place my son was at, where it was at, and that he was all right. I had to go out speak in front of three, 4,000 people when my son was under attack. It was very difficult that day. Somebody else's son, well, I'll pray about it. When it's your own son... <laughs> Everybody heard him. And verse 6, the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. Ephraim is a metaphor for the ten northern kingdoms, and the people of Israel were defeated there before the servants of David. And the slaughter there that day was great, 20,000 men, huge casualty figures for those days. For the battle there was spread over the whole countryside, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. More were being caught in the thicket and killed by the thicket than were killed in the actual battle. It would remind one of the Battle of the Wilderness in the American Civil War. Something similar happened. And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. And verse 9, for Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, and he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule 
that was under him kept going. When a certain man saw it, he, be, he told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. Then Joab said to the man who had told him, Now behold, you saw him. Why then did you not strike him there to the ground? And I would have given you ten pieces of silver and a belt. Now there's a whole typological meaning in that. And the man said to Joab, Even if I should receive a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, I would not put out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king charged you and Abishai and Etai, saying, Protect for me the young man Absalom. Otherwise, if I had dealt treacherously against his life, and there's nothing hidden from the king, then you yourself would have stood aloof. Then Joab said, I will not waste time here with you. So he took three spears in his hand and thrust him through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And ten young men who carried Joab's armor gathered around and struck Absalom and killed him. Then Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing Israel, for Joab restrained the people. And they took Absalom and cast him into a deep pit in the forest and erected over him a very great heap of stones. And all Israel fled each day to his tent. This is called an amphictyony. And by tradition, a present Hasmonean structure is built on the same location in the uh, Valley of Kidron. It may not be historically true, but that's where, by tradition, Orthodox Jews believe it is. Not just outside the Temple Mount on the southeast corner, essentially. Now, Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up for himself a pillar, which is in the King's Valley. That's where it is. For he said, I have no son to pres preserve my name. So he named the pillar after his own name, and it's called Absalom's Monument to this day. You can visit it. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said, Please let me run and bring the king news that the Lord has freed him from the hand of his enemies. But Joab said to him, You're not the man to carry news this day, but you should carry news another day. However, you shall carry no news today because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to the Cushite, go tell the king what you've seen. So the Cushite bowed to Joab and ran. Now a Cushite or a Cushi in Hebrew is the same as the Hebrew term for a black African. In biblical times, they did not know about the Congo or about Kenya or about Zimbabwe. They knew about Ethiopia, the land of Cush. So the Hebrew term for a black African and an Ethiopian is the same term in biblical Hebrew and even in modern Hebrew, a Cushi, a Cushite. It was a black person. Now Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said once more to Joab, but whatever happens, please let me also run after the Cushite. And Joab said, why would you run, my son, since you will have no reward for going? But whatever happens, he said, I will run. So he said to him, run. Then Ahimaaz ran by way of the plain and passed up the Cushite. And man, he must have had a fantastic pair of trainers to outrun a soul brother. I mean, <laughs> they win all the gold medals in the Olympics. Now David was sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof of the gate by the wall and raised his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was running by himself. And the watchman called and told the king, and the king said, if he's by himself, there's good news in his mouth. And he came nearer and nearer. The Hebrew term for good news is bisora, bisora. In the Septuagint, it is evangelion. It is the same term in both Greek and Hebrew for gospel. It is the same term in both Greek and Hebrew for gospel. There's good news. There's gospel in his mouth. That's what he says. There's good news in his mouth. If he's by himself, there's good news that he came nearer and nearer. In verse 26, the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called to the gatekeeper and said, Behold, another man running by himself. And the king said, This one also is bringing bisora, good news, evangelion, gospel. And the watchman said, I think the running of the first one is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. Obviously, he was a professional messenger, and they were able to recognize him at a distance by his running style of his sprint. 
And the king said, this is a good man, and he comes with good news. Good man with good news. And Ahimaaz called and said to the king, all is well. And he prostrated himself with the king with his face to the ground. And he said, blessed is the Lord your God who's delivered up the men who lifted their hands against my lord the king. And the king said, is it well with the young man Absalom? First words out of his mouth. Oh, David, you won the battle. How's my son? May the Lord... Do the same to all the people who raise up against you. How's my son? The first thing he cared about was the welfare of his son. He wasn't interested in the military news. He wasn't interested in how the battle went. He wasn't interested in anything until he first found out. How's my son? He was fixated on my son, my son, my son. That's all he could think about. That's all he wanted to know. Verse 29, is it well with the young man Absalom? And Ahimaaz answered, oh, when Joab sent the king's servant to your servant, I saw a great tumult, but I didn't know what it was. He knew very well what it was. He didn't want to tell the king what had happened. Then the king said, turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and stood still, and behold, the Cushite arrived. And the Cushite, the black man, said, let my lord the king receive good news, bisorah. The lord has freed you this day from the hand of all who rose up against you. Then the king said to the Cushite, is it well with the young man Absalom? First words out of his mouth, is my son all right? And the Cushite answered, let the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against you for evil be as that young man. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And thus he said as he walked, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The Hebrew text is much more emotive. Oi beni, oi beni, Absalom, Absalom, oi beni. You always remember that little baby you held in your arms. You're always going to remember them from the day they were born. Every parent is going to be like that. David wasn't interested in his military victory, that the kingdom had been preserved, that Israel and Judah would be remaining in the United States. None of that mattered. Oi beni, my son, my son, I wish it happened to me instead of you. I wish I was dead instead of you. Understand this. There's not one of us who are saved, not a Christian father or mother or a Christian grandparent, that would not die in place of their children or their grandchildren. It is the penultimate form of love called storga in Greek. There is actually a higher form of love than storga called agape. Agape is totally unconditional. You must be spiritually empowered or supernaturally empowered to agape. There's actually one place in the New Testament where somebody could be so wicked they were demonically empowered to love evil unconditionally. But you must be uh, supernaturally empowered to agape. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was no reason he should have done it. He chose to do it. It's just completely unconditional. But you have to be spiritually empowered to agape. But people can storga. God created storga to teach us about himself. The reason that you or I would die to save the lives of our children or grandchildren is because we're Imagio Dei beings. We're made in the image and likeness of a God who would die to save us. That is a love that God put in us to teach us about his love for us. When I was a young Christian, I used to say the cliche, Jesus is my personal savior. I used to say that, but I didn't know what it meant. I only knew half of what it meant. 
I thought it meant I had accepted him personally on McDougal Street in Greenwich Village in New York, therefore he's my personal savior. That's half of what it means. A personal savior means something much more than that, although it does include that. What it means is, if you or I were the only person who ever sinned, we're not. But if you or you or you or you, if you were the only person who ever sinned, the only one, God would have become a man and went to the cross just for you. Yes, Jesus died for all of us, but Jesus died for each of us. That's how much he loves us. How should we love him? Just think of it. You're not the only person who ever sinned against God, either am I, but even if we were, he would have went through the whole thing just for us. That's his love. And we just have a little sense of what that is through the love we have for our children. I know he's no good. I know she's no good. She's out. She's on drugs. She's whoring around. He's out. He's fornicating. He's this. He's backslidden. He's with it. But that's still my kid. We'd still die to save their life if we could. That teaches what God's like. If you're not saved, that's how much he loves you. And that's how terrible the second death is, that he'd have to do that to keep you from going to the second death. Don't walk out of this place without knowing somebody who loves you that much. If you reject somebody who loves you that much, you must hate yourself. But let's understand this further. I wish it was me instead of him. Now you have to understand the Old Testament is a shadow of the new. It's typological. It's a symbol of the new. The meaning of the Old Testament is a shadow of what's revealed in Christ in the New Testament. Under the Old Covenant, under the law, the king could only wish it was possible to die in place of somebody he loved. David could only wish he could have died to save his son. But what was not possible under the old covenant is possible in the new. Jesus, the son of David, the king, did die in place of someone he loved. You understand? It's showing a relationship between the covenants. But not only did Absalom die, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, it says in the Torah. Not only did he die, he died in such a way as it meant he was accursed of God. Not only would David know that his son died, he would have known that his son died cursed of God. I wish I had died on that tree instead of him. Under the law, that was not possible. Under the old covenant, that was not possible. Under the new, it was. The only reason you or I are not going to die a curse of God is because Jesus took that curse and went to that tree in our place. It's showing a relationship between the two covenants. You're going to die cursed of God if you don't accept Jesus who died in your place. All David could do is mourn. Now notice Absalom was hanging on the tree and they pierced him. What happened in the gospel? Jesus was hanging on the tree and the, and the Roman legionnaire pierced him. You understand? It's a shadow. It's an Old Testament type. I wish it happened to me. Hanging on the tree pierced. He was pierced for our transgressions. Well, there's the messenger, this black guy, and there's Ahimaaz. Ahimaaz says, let me go tell the king. Let me tell the king the good news. We won, we won, hallelujah. Let me go tell the king. No, that's, you don't want to do that. You're not the one to tell him what happened. 
No, I want to tell the king. No, let this other guy go. So the African guy goes. But this other guy takes a shortcut and outruns him. I want to tell the king. He gets there and the king asks him, what about my son? First words out of his mouth, that's all he wanted to know, is my son all right? Well, I don't really know what was happening. There was a battle, there was a tumult, it was all confused, but you won the war. <laughs> that was not his priority. This is the issue facing the church today. They only want to give the good news. They don't want to give the bad news. Don't speak about righteousness, sin, hell, judgment. Just give the good news. I read a book called The Purpose Driven Lie. It's not based on the scripture, it's based on marketing psychology, and this book said the following. I'm quoting directly. When you see an unsaved person living immorally, like I was, shacking up with my girlfriend in First Avenue in Manhattan, and when you see someone into substance abuse, like I was, strung out on coke, don't tell them they need to repent. That's a negative message. We have to be seeker-sensitive, seeker-friendly. Just tell them they need Jesus in their life. Once Jesus comes into their life, then he'll clean them up. What that book does is confuses what the scripture calls justification with sanctification. The reason I don't take cocaine anymore is because of sanctification, because Jesus cleaned me up. Well, he's in the process of doing it, but... But that's not how I was justified. Unless somebody repents, Jesus is not coming into their life. Repent and believe the gospel. Save yourself from this wicked and perverse generation. I saw you have some material by my friend Dave Comfort, uh, De uh, Ray Comfort, nice Jewish boy from New Zealand. I did a conference with Ray in England. He has a tape called Hell's Best Kept Secret. Boy, is he right. Don't preach grace until you preach law. Unless people know they're lost, they won't know how good it is to be found. Where did the apostles ever teach a gospel without repentance? Where did John the Baptist ever teach that? Where did Jesus or the Hebrew prophets ever say such a thing? Where did anybody who God ever used to bring revival do that? Where did John Wesley do that? Where did D.L. Moody do that? They never did that. Unless somebody is convicted of sin, the Greek term is eklenktos, eklenktik, Unless there is a conviction of sin and a repentance, they're not going to be truly born again in the biblical sense. No repentance, no true regeneration. They have to come to that realization of sin and the need for repentance. It is a false gospel. There was another deceiver from here in California who wrote a book, and he said, we're going to take the gospel out of the language of the courtroom and put it into the language of the family living room. Instead of God as an angry judge, we're going to have God as a loving father. The two are not mutually exclusive. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John put the gospel in the language of the courtroom. Jesus was put on trial in our place. We were guilty of the things he was accused of. He was innocent, but we were guilty of it. You cannot know God as loving Father until you understand he is an angry judge who will judge sin. Oh no, we have to be seeker-sensitive, user-friendly. A deluded gospel is useless. 
I just want to give the good news. I don't want to give the bad news. Don't tell me about unsaved people going to hell. Don't tell me about my loved ones dying without Christ. I don't want to hear that. I want a positive message. This is based on pop psychology. It's not based on theological reality. Just give him the good news. I want to give the good news. He's a good man and he has good news. Grace is free but it is not cheap. You hear what I said? Grace is free, but it is not cheap. It cost God everything when he gave his son in my place and in your place. Free, yes. Cheap, no. But too much of the modern church has cheapened it. Just give the good news. God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. Just put your hands up, brother. Yes, I see you, sister. God bless you. <laughs> Man, I got friends in hell from drugs, and I should have been one of them. I was more crazy than most of them. Nobody wants to face this. Absalom. That's my mother in that coffin. I have an unsaved mother in her 80s. That's my father in that grave. That's my husband in that casket. That's my daughter on that slab. That's my son who's dead in that body bag. You're standing at the grave. That's my sibling. That's my brother. That's my sister. That's my mother. And they left this life not knowing Jesus. There is nothing more difficult than dealing with that. You can deal with career setback, financial setback, crisis in health, business failure, failed relationships. Oh, I'm 33, and the biological clock is ticking away, and I don't have a husband yet. You might have lucked out, lady. You could have wound up with a bum like me. <laughs> That's stuff you can deal with. That's stuff you can deal with. But the death of an unsaved loved one? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? If they were a Christian, you have a future hope, a certain hope. If they weren't, what hope do you have? People take respite in the fact that, well, maybe they accepted the Lord at the instant between life and death and they had, you know, the Bible doesn't teach that Really, the only place it speaks of that, gives us any sense of that, was in the martyrdom of Stephen. And he did have a revelation of Christ, but it was a revelation of a Christ in whom he had already believed. Now, the question is often asked, the Lord will take away every tear. How can we enjoy heaven or the millennial reign of Christ or the blessings of eternity knowing our loved ones are eternally lost. How can we enjoy eternity with the Lord knowing that our loved ones are in hell? People ask that question, and it's a reasonable question. How can the Lord take away every tear? Look with me, please, to Isaiah 26, verse 14. The dead will not live, the departed spirits will not rise in the resurrection of the righteous, of course. Therefore thou hast punished and destroyed them. Thou hast wiped out all remembrance of them. No, they are not annihilated. But what is annihilated is our remembrance of them. You understand? In eternity, we will not know such people ever existed. In eternity, we will not know that they ever existed. 
It's like an ancestor who died before you were born. You won't be able to gauge the loss because you would never have known them. That's how God is going to do it. He's going to annihilate our recollection of them. They won't be annihilated, but our capacity to remember them will be. The Lord will take away every tear. But in the meantime, we have to live with it. As far as I know, my father is in hell. As far as I know, most of my family who died are in hell. As far as I know, ultimately God, ultimately only God knows, but as far as we can know, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When it comes to family, though, that objective fact becomes somehow pliable because we begin to think with our emotions instead of our head. But it remains a fact. That's my brother. That's my mother. That's my father. That's... This is serious business. Let's continue reading for a few minutes what happens next in 2 Samuel. Chapter 19, verse 1, Then it was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourns for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned to mourning all the people, for the people heard it and said, The king is grieved for his son. So the people went by stealth into that city that day, as people who are humiliated steal away when they flee in battle. Although they won the battle, they counted it as a defeat. I don't mind lifting up the sword against Islam. I don't mind lifting up the sword against Roman Catholicism. I don't mind lifting up the sword against Jehovah's Witness or Mormons. But when I have to warn Christians about books like A Purpose Driven Lie, I don't like lifting up my sword against my brother. You understand? There's no joy in those victories, even if you win. The book of Judges is a book of wars from beginning to end, but the costliest, bloodiest war was the last one. Because the last war in the book of Judges was not Hebrew fighting Amalekite or Hebrew fighting Philistine. It was Hebrew fighting Hebrew. When you lift up a sword against your brother, even if you win, there's no joy in that victory. And the king covered his face and cried with a loud voice, My son, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son, Oi beni, oi beni, Absalom. Then Joab came into the house of the king and said, Today you've covered with shame the faces of all your servants who today saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines by loving those who hate you and hating those who loved you. For you have shown today that princes and servants are nothing to you. For I know this day that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead, you'd be pleased. Don't you think these people who fought for you, who put their lives on the line to save your neck and to save this country, don't you think they have sons? Don't you think they have brothers and fathers and husbands? Don't you think they have as much grounds to grieve as you do? And you're crying over Absalom. Would you have rather these people who fought for you died and Absalom lived? That's what he asked the king, and he must have had some audacity to ask that of a king. But he was right. Verse 7, now therefore arise, go out and speak kindly to your servants. But I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, surely not a man will pass the night with you. And this will be worse for you than all the evil that's come upon you from your youth until now. There is one thing worse than coming to terms with the death of an unsaved loved one. One thing worse not handling it scripturally. It's a terrible tragedy. 
But if you don't come to terms with it scripturally, if you're simply ruled by your own emotion and grief and sense of loss, you will never be able to deal with it. It will destroy you. It will destroy you emotionally. It will wound your spirit grievously. These other ones who fought for you, what about them, David? I pray every day my mother gets saved. My father is eternally lost as far as I know. I pray every day she gets saved. But if God forbid she doesn't, how am I going to deal with it? How are you going to deal with it when it happens and it happens to believers? We all have to deal with this. There's no way getting around it. You can read all the books of pop psychology masquerading as doctrine we want. It's not going to help you cope with the reality. This is reality. It's only this is going to help us cope. The rest is all rubbish. If it doesn't agree with this, throw it away. Let's look. Your mother and your brothers are outside. I'm sorry, but your father died unsaved. I'm sorry, but your sibling died unsaved. I'm sorry, but they died and they weren't saved. I'm sorry. That's terrible. Your mother died unsaved? Behold my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my father who's in heaven, he's my brother and sister and mother. It is a wonderful blessing if your husband is a believer. It's a wonderful blessing if your wife is a believer. If you have the advantage, the privilege, the blessing that I didn't of having Christian parents, I envy you in a manner of speaking. It's a wonderful thing to have siblings who are believers. I have a sister who's a believer. It's a wonderful thing to have family who are saved. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't even know me, and you're not missing much if you don't, I am eternally closer to you than your own brother if he's not saved. You are closer to me than my own father who died unsaved. Oh, it's my brother. Oh, it's my mother. Oh, it's my sister. You are my mother. You are my brother. You are my sister. We're together forever. He who does the will of my Father. In the few moments that remain, I would like us all in earnest to beg God, to beseech him, to plead with him for the salvation of our unsaved family and loved ones. For that brother, that sister, that son, that daughter, that parent or grandparent, there's nothing more important than this. After our own salvation, there is nothing more important than the salvation of our families. God is a God who hears prayer, who answers prayer. And as much as we love our families, as much as we love our unbelieving families, as much as we love them, God loves them even more than we do. As much as we want them to be saved, as much as we desire their salvation, God wants them to be saved more than we do. He's a God of salvation. After our own salvation, there is nothing more important than this. Let us come before the throne of grace and beg God for the salvation of our unsaved families.
Let's pray. You just bring those people, that person, that son, that daughter, that parent, that sibling, that unbelieving husband, that unsaved wife, grandparent, whatever, God knows, you bring them to Jesus. Ask him to do anything that's necessary to see them come to the cross.